Swift News is back after about a two week break. And that's because I was in crunch time getting my latest app launched and over the finish line, going back and forth with app review for about a week and a half. Anyway, it's finally live on the app store. It's an F1 widgets app. So if you're a Formula One fan, go check it out. Or if you just wanna see how I designed a ton of widgets, you can download it on the app store. I'll put a link in the description. And as always, if you like it, or if you wanna help out, those five-star reviews are insanely important to get the app launching on the app store. So I'd appreciate it. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter if you want Swift News in your inbox every Monday. All right, let's get into it. To kick things off, we have some pretty big news. Swift.org announces the Android Workgroup. And as you can see right here, the Android Workgroup is a team that promotes the use of Swift for developing Android applications. What? So what does this mean? Well, first of all, this is brand new, super early days. Don't expect to be able to just write Swift, build an Android app, be good to go, use Swift UI, all that stuff. But if this piqued your interest like it did me, you can read through the charter. As it says, the main goal of the Android Workgroup is to add and maintain Android as an officially supported platform for the Swift language. So the work group is going to maintain Android support for the official Swift distribution, recommend enhancements to core Swift packages to work better with Android idioms, develop and support debugging Swift applications on Android, and much more, as you can see. But like I said, early days, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I had a lot of questions. So I recommend also going through this forum post where they announce it because scrolling down a little bit, a couple posts down, there's a nice little Q&A here that answers some pretty basic questions that I think a lot of us are going to have here. I think a lot of us feel this way right here. I'm sorry to ask this, but like in layman's terms, how are we going to use it? I mean, we write code in Swift, but how are we going to build it for Android? What about the UI design? Do we design for both iOS and Android and business logic in Swift? They go through and answer a bunch of these questions. Will it be possible to use Jetpack Compose with Swift in the future? The work group has made no decisions on UI frameworks. So again, early days. Right now they're focusing on the business logic. You figure out the UI is where we're at right now. A couple years down the line, maybe that changes. Or is there any plan to bring Swift UI to Android? Nope, Swift UI is proprietary UI for Apple platforms. No plans to, to bring that over. So like I said, you can read through a lot of these common questions and answers, but essentially the very first step, you can write cross-platform business logic, and then you got to handle the UI on your own. Maybe that will change and evolve in the future. Like I said, super early days, but it's a pretty promising development seeing Swift on Android and hopefully soon one day we'll be able to use all of our Swift skills to bring our iOS apps over to Android. Next up, as is tradition, every year we have What's New in Swift UI for iOS 26 by Paul Hudson. And this year was a little light on features. The two main headlines here are Swift UI gets a native web view. And then a big one that I think a lot of us are gonna use is rich text editing in the text view with attributed string. So what you have to do with your text editor is pass in a binding to an attributed string, and then you get the built-in formatting, like the bold, italic, strike through, all that stuff, for free out of the box in your text editor. So that's a really, really nice addition. And there's some small things, like get section index labels. Think of the contacts app. You have that alphabet going down the right side. We now get access to that. You can give label icons a fixed width, which is a nice quality of life, because if you use the native label in Swift and your icons are different widths, it usually gets messed up. We get an animatable macro that makes it easier to animate views, modifiers, and more. And a lot of the stuff has to do with liquid glass, right? How to make tab view minimize on scroll. How to add a tab view accessory, right? Think the Apple Music app. Add a space in the toolbar to visually group your toolbar items. Again, this is all unique to Liquid Glass, but a pretty light uh, release overall for SwiftUI, but I welcome it because we're all gonna spend our summer adopting our apps for Liquid Glass, and that is gonna be a huge undertaking. So again, I welcome light on features, and I think the, the star of the show here is the new text view with the attributed string, so you get the built-in bold italic strike through so your user can format text in your text view. Moving on, I have a couple articles about getting started with Apple's foundation model framework. So even if SwiftUI didn't give us a lot of new toys to play with, we got a pretty big one in Apple's foundation models. And I think they're a big deal, and I think every iOS developer is going to have to know how to use them. So let's talk about getting started with them. Jordan Morgan here of Superwall has a great, very beginner, very basic getting started. We start off with availability checks because the one thing you need to know is requires Apple intelligence. As you know, not all devices support Apple intelligence. So it's gonna be a pretty big deal if you're using foundation models to be like, hey, can I even run this here? And then you also have to have like a backup experience if you can't. Luckily, Apple has built all those checks into a simple model dot is available. So that's super nice and easy. And of course there's different cases, right? It is available, cool, go ahead and do your thing. It's unavailable, but Apple intelligence is not enabled. So even if the device supports it, the user's got to enable it. So you got that case, device not eligible, device doesn't support it, model not ready, model still being downloaded, or if it's unavailable. So that's the first thing you need to know, if you can even use it on the device. 
And then he gives an example of how simple it is to start a language model session and then submit the prompt. Tell me a knock knock joke. Obviously that's a super basic hello world type example. And then you just do try await session dot respond to prompt. And there you go. Again, super basic example, but it's super simple to get started with this stuff. And the next level up on that would be a turn by turn or multi-turn interactions where you're actually going back and forth chatting with the model, but that's still relatively simple as well. And then he talks about giving instructions. And what they do is they point the model towards a specific goal, persona, or general task it should perform. And he gives some tips on writing effective instructions. What should the model be doing? What role is it specifically responsible for? What kind of preferences should you consider in the response? So again, the instructions are to guide the model, if you will. So that's a great initial getting started by Jordan Morgan of Superwall. And then there's a really cool thing with these foundation models called tool calling. And Alex here has an article all about tool calling with Apple intelligence. And to put it simply, it's a way to augment the model with more information. Well, don't LLMs have like all the information in the world? Yes, but not specific to your user or specific to your use case. So a common example is you can use a tool to provide extra data, such as the user's health information, right from HealthKit. Or the example that this article gives, building a coffee app, maybe your coffee app or coffee store has a very specific menu. You can provide the model your specific menu via tool calling. So now it can answer intelligently questions about your menu. So tool calling is a way to give the model extra information and oftentimes it's much more targeted to what you're trying to do with the model. And this article from Alex here gives you a walkthrough on how to set that up. As you can see, you're creating a type called tool and then you pass in the information via an arguments. Usually it's just a string. So in this example, Alex passed in just a string of his menu, kind of like you're prompting ChatGPT, you just give it a giant string gives that example. But tool calling is a huge skill to get the most out of these on-device LLMs. So Alex has got you covered here with that article. And then finally, I got Asim Sharp here, the ultimate guide to the foundation models framework that ties it all together. We'll scroll through here. As you can see, it's a pretty long article going through all the basics, kind of hitting on what Jordan hit on, hitting on what Alex hit on as well. But it's a great opportunity, I believe, especially when you're learning a brand new topic, to hear things explained multiple different ways from multiple different teachers. Because I found, at least in my experience and my experience teaching others as well, that a lot of times you have to hear things explained two or three times in two or three different ways, and then it finally clicks. So I'm a big advocate of repetition. If you follow my courses, I say that all the time. And foundation models are super important. So please, when you're learning it, learn from multiple different sources and don't be afraid to repeat lessons. Next up, we have an article from David Smith, considerations for new iOS versions, because especially this year in iOS 26 in liquid glass, it is gonna be very tempting to be like, I'm just gonna require iOS 26, right? Because as a developer, that's gonna save you a ton of work and be much more convenient using the latest and greatest APIs, not having to have if available checks everywhere, especially for all the new liquid glass UI stuff, if you're going to adopt that. So this year in particular <laughs> is a much more tempting year to only support iOS 26. Now, of course, you know, if you have a huge app with millions and millions of users, no, that's not even a consideration. But if you have a new app with maybe a lesser number of users, that is a consideration. And of course, there's no one right answer for everyone. It depends on all kinds of circumstances, but he talks about some things to consider. So your existing users, if you did decide to just say, hey, you know what? I only support iOS 26 and above. If you have a large existing user base, it might not be the end of the world because yeah, they're going to still get the current version that they're on that hopefully works great, solves their problem, does everything they need. They're just not gonna get future updates until they update to iOS 26. So the interesting point here is if you have large existing user base, you can make a case for going iOS 26 and above. However, if you are still growing, this is where it kind of catches you here. And he talks about this here for new users, because what happens, especially if you make it iOS 26 only on day one, your app stops showing up for everyone that's on iOS 18 and below. And as you know, only a small percentage of people upgrade day one. So you're basically chopping off your new user growth if you do it day one. Now he does illustrate that typically, you know, iOS comes out in September or so, and then by November, it's, you know, about 85, 90%, and it kind of like plateaus from there on what it's going to be. I also listened to the podcast under the radar that him and Marco talked about this, because Marco's in a situation where he's not growing a lot with his podcast app Overcast, but he has a ton of like existing users. So he's being tempted to support only iOS 26 and above because he doesn't have a ton of new users coming in, right? Growth isn't his main driver. However, if growth is still your main driver, you're really like handicapping yourself by going iOS 26 from day one. But as David points out here, by about November, December, you won't be hindering yourself so much by going iOS 26 and above. But it's a great read by David Smith here if you're considering what version to support. And then I recommend also listening to the podcast Under the Radar. They did a whole episode talking all about this.
Moving on, we have understanding and improving SwiftUI performance from Cal Stevens of the Airbnb tech blog. So Airbnb adopted SwiftUI back in 2022. I'd say that's a pretty early adopter. That's like iOS 14 days, maybe 15. So yeah, they've been working with it, slowly integrating with it, but obviously Airbnb has a ton of scale and they do talk about a lot of the productivity benefits of developers using SwiftUI because it is a lot easier to build in. However, SwiftUI comes with a lot of performance issues if you're not doing it right. And as he points out right here, like there are many common code patterns in SwiftUI that can be inefficient and many small paper cuts can add up to a large performance hit over time. So the first thing they talk about is they created this epoxy library. Now, this is unique to Airbnb. They have their own unidirectional data flow system. And the first thing they talk about is that how they were using closures in this system. And well, really they talk about how you should understand the SwiftUI view diffing system, because this is how bodies get reevaluated and your view gets updated. And a lot of the performance issues are unnecessary view updates. And a lot of that can be fixed in your code, but they, they give background on understanding how SwiftUI's view diffing algorithm works. And then they give examples on showing like how when they put a color behind this, how unnecessarily these views are updating. You see the color is being changed. And what they discovered, now this is again unique to Airbnb, when reviewing different views in our code base, we found several common patterns that confounded SwiftUI's diffing algorithm. Some types are inherently not supported, like closures. And they were passing around closures a lot, which was leading to a lot of unnecessary view updates. So they fixed that. But again, that's kind of unique to Airbnb maybe because they're passing around a lot of closures. Maybe your app doesn't do that. But one thing that a lot of us probably do is we go down here, um, they talk about how they created an equitable macro to, to fix that. But again, that might be unique to them. What I found interesting that a lot of us probably do is managing the size of view body. So a lot of us probably use these private var header section and you have your UI or var card action and then you have your UI versus splitting those out into a separate view, right? Instead of a card action section being a computer property on a view, this would be a separate struct view. And they show the example right here, where it's like, yep, here it is, header section, that's a separate struct that is a view, card section, view, struct. And this goes back to like day one basics of SwiftUI that we're all told is to create very small, composable, reusable views, right? These structs are super cheap. Don't worry about creating a ton of little small ones, aside from like, code readability and navigating the code base, that might get confusing. But as far as performance wise, you want these small structs rather than these computed properties for your UI. And that's because having separate small structs and views allows SwiftUI's view differing algorithm to work a lot better and properly leading to performance gains. So those are the two big things. And again, I wanted to point out this computed property variable thing because I've done it in my apps. I've seen it done in a lot of apps. I've seen it done in like Apple's demo code. So. I think in and of itself, it's probably not like a no-no, never do that. But you know, if you're trying to eke out every little performance gain, that can be a cause of uh, issues there. So probably better to just break it all out into separate structs and reuse those views. Next up, the Deep Dish Swift Conference in Chicago every year, usually in the spring, has started releasing their videos from the 2025 conference. And they're kind of leaking them out you know, every day or two. So there's only a couple up here now, but these are gonna grow and grow as the weeks go on. So I went to the 2024 version, had a blast. It's an awesome conference. I can't wait for all these videos to be released so I can check them out and watch them. Uh, the history of iOS development, Adam Shaw, that looks super interesting. I always love those like a walk through history and kind of reminiscing or seeing how things were done before I was here in the iOS development world. And then we got, you know, hidden gems of Swift developers from Stuart Lynch. That's a great one. So anyway, check out Deep Dish Swift's YouTube channel. Give them a subscribe, watch all the videos. It's good stuff here. And then finally we have Revenue Cat with Ship A Ton is back. They did this last year around this time. Basically, it's like a hackathon. Last a couple months. The basic rules are you have to launch an app between August and September. It has to be version one. Can't just like ship an update, but there's over 300,000 in prizes. You can watch this four minute video from Charlie here with all the details. One of the prizes is a trip to New York City and then you get your app here in Times Square. That's pretty cool. There's custom shippy trophies. Uh, they're, they're doing it big this year. And you can target your app towards categories. There's, you know, the Build and Public Award, the Best Vibes Award, Buzziest Launch Award, Build and Grow Grand Prize. There's a whole bunch of different categories. And each category, I believe, first prize, they upped it this year. I can't remember. You'd have to like look into the details, but it's, you know, 15, 20 grand. Like it's pretty significant prize money. They're, they're really going big. They got a lot of sponsors this year for it. And it's going global. There's a lot of like in person or ship a ton IRL. So we're teaming up with dev communities around the world, host in person and virtual events so you can meet fellow shippers, get inspired and build together. So anyway, huge event from Revenue Cat. Definitely go check that out. And hopefully it inspires you to build something or, or finally launch that app. That's what it did last year. I was a judge for it last year. Saw a ton of amazing apps. It was an awesome event last year. So I'm happy to see them back and doing it bigger and better. All right, that wraps it up for this week's episode of Swift News. See you in the next one.